of the Mason Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 149, covering the week of December 3rd through December 7th, 2018. Glad to have you back in the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute, like our Facebook page at Abbeville Institute, and subscribe to our YouTube page at Abbeville Institute. You can find all those social media buttons by going to our website, abbevilleinstitute.org. That's A-B-B-E-V-I-L-L-E, institute.org. At the top of the page, you'll find all our social media buttons. You can also give us an email address, and we'll give you a free ebook, and you'll get our daily dose of Dixie Monday through Friday, along with our weekly email Saturday or Sunday, which includes a link to this podcast. You can also download our free app. Just go to your favorite app store. And pick up our app, iTunes, Google Play, and you'll get the Abbeville Institute on the go. It includes this podcast, all of our lectures, and a mobile link to the Abbeville Institute website and all of our lectures. We do have the lectures from the summer school now available on the app and, of course, on our webpage. So that's a great resource, over 200 lectures free of charge on uh, our application and our webpage. Also, don't forget that Christmas is coming up. If you want to get your Abbeville Institute gear, you can go to our webpage again. Click on the uh, top of the page. You'll see a, a, a tab that says Support. Under that, you'll have Shop, and you can get your embroidered material, hats, fleece jackets, polo shirts, T-shirts, great stuff, high quality. Also, it will not get destroyed in your washing machine or your dryer. Multiple colors, so great. It's a great gift. But time is running out to do that. That does take them a week or so to get the material to you. So go on out to that uh, page, abbevillinstitute.org, at the top of the page where it says uh, support. Click on that shop button. Go to our store and get that material for you for that Abbeville Institute fan and your family. And you can also support the Abbeville Institute by clicking on that same tab. It'll say uh, donation options. You can donate monthly or annually. The end of 2018 is fast approaching, so make the Abbeville Institute, part of your tax preparations for 2018. Your your contribution is tax deductible to the full extent of the law. So go on out there and make a donation to the Institute. Help keep the podcast going, the lights on, our conferences going, our website going, all those wonderful things that you enjoy. We do exist on your generous contributions alone. All right, well, let's talk about the week that was at the Abbeville Institute. And the major theme for the week was the Constitution. And various individuals that uh, played a role in the adoption and also interpretation of the document. But we'll start with something that was not in relation to that. Uh, The first piece of the week, which I think was one of the more interesting pieces we've ever published at the Institute. It was uh, entitled The Tragedy of Land Use in the South, written by Nicole Williams. And Nicole Williams um, has served for a time... Um, as a staffer for uh, a member of parliament in the House of Commons in Great Britain. Um, She's interested in uh, land use, obviously, um, southern colonial history, um, and contemporary culture. Um, So she has undergraduate degrees and postdoctorate degrees or postgraduate degrees from the University of Glasgow. So uh, she's uh, spent a lot of time in, uh, in Europe. But this particular piece, and, and of course, I think that's, that's interesting to have a, a perspective uh, on the South from that posi- particular position, namely because when you look at the Southern tradition, and we've talked about this a lot on, on, on the podcast, the influence of Europe and Western civilization and how the Old South, and many Europeans recognize this, the Old South was the last offender of traditional Western civilization. And so... Uh, There's a reason why so many individuals from Europe looked at the United States and looked at the South in the United States as the true heir of traditional Western civilization, both before and after the war. And uh, that's something that we often forget. How when we look at the South and the way that the South is often portrayed in America as the as the other, you have your Southern Studies programs. You have uh, all this focus and attention on the South as the odd other in American society. But in the world, and perhaps it is to the North, it is the, the strange section to those in the North. But to the world, for most of history, 
the South was the normal section, and it was the North that was the odd section. It was the North that was rapidly industrializing, uh, which was in uh, oddity, or in, in opposition, I should say, oddity, in opposition to the rest of the world. Now, of course, Great Britain and Germany would eventually industrialize as well, uh, and before the, before the North would do it, but uh, certainly the South was much like the rest of the world during the 18th century, even during the 19th century. And so the culture of the South was much like the rest of the world, or at least in Western civilization, in the antebellum period. And, of course, Southerners saw themselves as an extension of, uh, of this traditional Western civilization long after the war was over. So this particular piece gets into the idea of how we're using land. And she's very critical of strip malls and the misuse, what she labels the misuse of land in the South, these urban centers uh, that have no connection to the traditional society that uh, that they spring from. It's just, we're going to build a strip mall. Uh, and part of that is because, of course, all the people moving into the South, um, and, of course, Southerners at least trying to capitalize on uh, the fact that they own a lot of land and they're trying to make money. But when you look at how this land is being used, there, when you build these strip malls and you build these uh, parking lots and car lots and all these things that pop up around the South, you're losing the anchor. You're losing the, the uh, attachment to this old Southern tradition. And she says, our forefathers certainly value beauty. Traveling through the Virginia Tidewater, the Blue Ridge Mountains, or the Chesapeake, or I'm sorry, the South Carolina Low Country, one can easily discern the beauty in the simple houses, tobacco fields, or rolling hills. The historic city centers of Charleston, Savannah, and even smaller towns such as Madison, Georgia, and Abbeville, South Carolina, exemplify the delicate care in which our ancestors valued the places in which they lived and labored. And she says, of course, this is not the South that many of us see on a daily basis. Coal slurry runoff has turned some of the waterways in Appalachia black. Highways are littered with retailers such as Home Depot, Bed Bath & Beyond, and Walmart. Additionally, the vast majority of the buildings that are used for retail activity are built with shoddy materials and are not likely to withstand the next 50 years and are so ugly that they are not likely to be adapted for reuse into the coming decades. Our once beautiful towns, villages, and farms have been cheapened by outside influencers and investors determined to extract profits was contributing as little as possible, maintaining our communities and the southern landscape. Urban centers throughout the south continue to expand, gobbling up increasing amounts of woodland and agricultural land. Critics may say that this is the price of progress. One only need look at cities like Atlanta, which are dominated by a consumerist culture, which is manifest in retail shopping centers and poorly constructed tract houses. The price of cheap goods and, and development is taking its toll in the South. Even the precious Gula region of Georgia and South Carolina is slow dis slowly disappearing due to the overdevelopment and the eagerness of those who inherit family land to make an easy profit. Plantation houses lost in neglect, revolutionary war battlefields sit amongst suburban housing developments, and communities flood in southern Louisiana due to the intrusion of salt water into the freshwater estuaries near the Mississippi River brought on by continued energy extraction efforts. What a lot of people don't realize, and if you read this and you, and you look at it from the outside, you think, well, this person's a leftist. And these positions that she's advocating, uh, these agrarian positions, are often considered leftist. But um, this attachment to land in place is something larger than political ideology. It's a love of people. It's a love of the beauty of the natural environment. It's not based on some type of, of um, nature worshiping. Southerners in their agrarian position were often looking at this from a Christian worldview. We are stewards of God's beauty and God's land, and so therefore it must be used properly and correctly. It must reflect God's splendor. And I don't think that Miss Williams advocates 
uh, moving away from development. It's doing it properly. And she's very critical of, say, local governments. She says that local governments have been a part of this. Southerners themselves looking to make a quick profit are part of this. And that's because they've lost that, that uh, attachment again to the tradition, the Southern tradition. Um, and so when you think about that, when you think about what's happening in the South and the erosion of the Southern tradition, the New South economy is a reflection on that. The New South economy that we all live in is a reflection on that poor understanding of where we come from, remembering who we are, as Emmy Bradford put it. Um, and when you look at modern politics and you look at how much of modern politics is tied into this rural-urban split and how we do these things, um, you wonder what's going to happen as the South continues to industrialize, to urbanize, how that's going to affect Southern culture. Now, there's a reason Jefferson was so opposed to urbanization. Uh, and, of course, this consumer culture. So Southerners love this stuff just as much as anyone else. I mean, there's no doubt about that. It's the reason it's here. Southerners love to go to fast food restaurants. They love to go to Home Depot and Walmart. Walmart's a Southern company founded in Arkansas. They love these things. But one would want to think that there could be some way to plan for these things better. You know, urban planning, regional development, these things are often seen as part of the progressive movement. In some ways, they are. Progressives were certainly uh, instrumental in coming up with zoning ordinances and uh, planning, urban planning. But on the other hand, maybe these things are beneficial for a, a community, a society, and ensuring that they can maintain the traditional makeup of that community and society. So this is an interesting piece. It's one that we, we do these things. We'll, we'll publish pieces on the agrarian tradition, agrarianism in general. And oftentimes, again, these are seen as leftist positions. Um, but more importantly, they are part of the Southern tradition, being good stewards of the land, being good stewards of the environment, ensuring that we leave for generations to come, not just strip malls and Home Depots and Walmarts, but the beauty, God's beauty, of the natural environment. Uh, and that involves, I mean, you can look at this as a government-led position, or you can look at it as an individual position. What can you do? What can you do to think locally and act locally and maintain that natural environment and the beauty of your own community? By being good stewards of the land yourself, good stewards of resources, um, there are things that you can do through economic activity to help that. So, uh, and it's not just from government. You have beautiful places in the South, like Callaway Gardens in Pine Mountain, Georgia, which is entirely privately owned. It's a it's a nonprofit organization, and their job is to be a good steward of the environment. They say it, and it doesn't have to be government. It can be private individuals who do this exact same thing. And that's I wish that more people of means in the South that have land and money would look at the Callaway Gardens model. And say, you know, it would be wonderful to have these type of gardens all throughout the South. Places, uh, nature sanctuaries for people to go and enjoy the natural beauty that we have. If you've never been to Callaway Gardens, it is a pristine, superb place. One that uh, I'd highly recommend you attend uh, during various times of the year. Of course, during the spring and the fall. It's, it's both times. Wonderful place. And uh, they have a butterfly garden, which is one of the best butterfly gardens, butterfly houses I've ever seen. Um, it's just an amazing, amazing place. And it's all private. Not one bit of government money goes into it. And so um, it's well worth your time if you're ever in the Georgia area near Columbus, Georgia, to go to Pine Mountain, Georgia, and go to Callaway Gardens. Um, I'd highly recommend it. It's not a state park. It's not a federal park. It's no, again, it's all private, private money uh, built by private individuals. The Callaway family, the Day family. If you're familiar with Days In, that's the Day family. So just a wonderful place, and uh, they're very interested in being good stewards of the Southern tradition. So all of that said, let's talk about the Constitution then, because that was the major thrust of the week, to look at the Constitution, who made it, and how it's been destroyed, and who tried to protect it. 
And so the first piece of the week that deals with that is one that's written by yours truly. It's a, it's a book review of a new book by Richard Brookheiser on John Marshall. And without question, John Marshall is a Southerner, Virginian, is one of the most important men in American history, I think, in the top five. Uh, when you look at their impact, their lasting impact, from the founding generation, I should say, their lasting impact on America. You know, Washington, of course, Hamilton, Jefferson, and uh, you cannot get around John Marshall. Uh, and I say that because John Marshall's tenure on the Supreme Court, on the federal bench, almost 35 years, has more to do with how Americans think about the Constitution and the government than virtually anyone else. Now, uh, that's because he was codifying Alexander Hamilton. I mean, Hamilton is, next to George Washington, the most, and I should say nowadays, Hamilton is the most important political thinker in American history. Not, not in a good way. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not laudatory of Hamilton in terms of what he did, but in terms of his lasting impact, there is no one more important. I wish it wasn't that way. I wish it was John C. Calhoun in terms of his views on government, or Thomas Jefferson in terms of his views on government. But Hamilton won. And Hamilton won because of John Marshall. Hamilton won because John Marshall codified everything Ham Hamilton wanted through various Supreme Court decisions. And so John Marshall sits on the bench for nearly 35 years and changes the entire interpretation of the Constitution. He does strengthen the power of the Supreme Court. He does make it perhaps the most powerful branch of government. Now, I could say that he saved the independency of the court, and he did. I think Brookheiser says the exact same thing. This is a very laudatory biography of John Marshall. Brookheiser is a nationalist. He is considered to be a neoconservative nationalist. He's a Straussian. Uh, the book is actually very well written. It's, it's a breezy read. It's very good. Uh, Brookheiser is a, is a good writer, and it's concise. It's, you don't plod through it. Uh, it is a fun read. He does a good job. He, he's a good wordsmith. And so I think if you're looking for a concise biography, a, a legal biography of John Marshall, it's not a comprehensive biography. It's He spends about a chapter on, on Marshall's uh, early life. If you're looking for a good legal biography of John Marshall, concise and readable, this is what you should pick up. And John Marshall, being a Southerner, he's he's someone that is... Uh, maybe an enigma in many ways. At least that's the way most people th think about it. I mean, John Marshall's a Virginian. He was had Jefferson's blood running through his veins, and yet here's a guy that goes out of his way to try to destroy everything Jefferson wanted at every chance he got. And I think that's due in large part to Marshall's fear of the French Revolution and the impact of Jacobinism on the world. I mean, he feared... Uh, terrorists, what he called terrorists, Jefferson and Republicans running around the countryside lopping off the heads of Federalists. He saw in America the danger of rampant democracy. He feared what he called demagogues. Even, But as Brookheiser says, Marshall was a populist. This is a guy that believed in the one people fallacy of America. And I, I, you know, Brookheiser says that Marshall is inconsistent. He's contradictory in his opinions, but not in the way that I think that we need to think about Marshall being contradictory in his opinions. Marshall was contradictory in his opinions because Marshall was ignoring everything he said during the Virginia Ratifying Conven Convention, everything he promised in the Virginia Ratifying Convention when it came to how the Constitution would be interpreted. His position on state powers was, as Supreme Court Chief Justice, was opposite of what he said that the Constitution would do to state powers in the Virginia Ratifying Convention. That's the problem with John Marshall. It's also the problem with Alexander Hamilton. But you see, Marshall was able to use the federal bench to codify Hamilton's vision of a loose construction of the Constitution, the Necessary and Proper Clause, which, of course, Hamilton made famous in his defense of the Bank of the United States. It was Marshall that codified that in McCulloch v. Maryland. It was Marshall that struck down the ability of the states, and the state courts in particular, to resist federal usurpation of power in Cohen's v. Virginia. So Marshall was doing so much to undermine originalism, but he's often considered an originalist. This is the, this is the wrong thing to do. Now, Brookheiser says that Marshall's a textualist, and I think this is correct. Marshall said we need to read the Constitution for what it says, but textualism invites loose interpretation. 
This is why textualism is a dangerous legal doctrine. You don't Textualism doesn't rely on the ratification debates, on how the Constitution was understood by the friends of the document. It relies on reading the Necessary and Proper Clause and saying, well, it says it's Necessary and Proper, which means we can do whatever we want to do. Textualism opens the door to progressivism. And so that's the important part of Marshall's legal de decisions, how dangerous they are, how dangerous they are for an original interpretation for federalism, which was the key to getting the whole Constitution ratified in the first place. If the friends of the document didn't promise we would have federalism, we wouldn't have had the Constitution. If the friends of the Constitution didn't promise that the states wouldn't retain virtually all powers, except for those expressly delegated to the central authority, the Constitution is not ratified. And so when Marshall becomes Chief Justice, he undermines all that. That's where Marshall is problematic. But again, if you want to get a good biography of John Marshall, a legal biography, a readable one, I would pick up Richard Brookheiser's biography. And um, uh, I'm no fan of, of Richard Brookheiser's uh, overall political philosophy. I mean, he's right on many things. He's an ally on many things. His view of Lincoln is incorrect. But we need to understand that there were nationalists in the South. And the other thing I think is, is important, and I've mentioned this on this, on this podcast before, that Southern nationalism is different from Northern nationalism. Southern nationalism, and I think John Marshall was genuinely a nationalist in that he wanted what was best in his mind for the entire Union, not just one section. He viewed nationalism as beneficial for the South as well. He was, as Brookheiser points out, a Washington Federalist. As Joseph Story eulogized, he was an old Federalist of the old Washington type of Federalism a real nationalist. George Washington was a real nationalist. Daniel Webster was a New England sectionist, the sectionalist disguised as a nationalist. Henry Clay, I think you could say, was a nationalist. So was Abraham Lincoln, of course, all Southerners as well. Uh, but their nationalism was always tied into their political careers. What could advance their best interest politically? not necessarily for the good of the whole. And I think you, you saw that with Henry Clay over and over again as the great compromiser, maintaining his own authority and political power. Lincoln was interested in party over union. I mean, this is, and interested in his own political well-being. But Marshall was something different. I think you can actually at least un admire Marshall for that. Uh, and there were, I mean, John C. Calhoun was this type of nationalist early in his career. We're, we're doing the what's best for the United States as a whole and his sectionalism was still nationalism. Look, you cannot damage the South. You can't pass a tariff. That's a sectional measure and call it nationalism. You can't do that. You can't do what's good for one section at the expense of another. His advocacy of the 1816 tariff was a true national position in that it was a revenue-producing tariff, and it was also a bone to the North after uh, what happened during the War of 1812. So, when you look at Southern nationalists, they were different from Northern nationalists. And so Marshall did much to destroy the original Constitution. This is the piece that we published on Wednesday, uh, where it was very critical of lawyers and the damage they do, they do to the Constitution. Now, a lot of lawyers and other people were upset about this piece. But the fact is, lawyers go to law school and they learn case law. And one particular commenter on social media said, this is fake news. Because it's not lawyers who do this, it's journalists. Well, how does a journalist produce case law? The fact is you go to law school and you learn case law. And then as this lawyer points out, we're, we're, we're uh, obligated to enforce this case law. This is, what we, this is what we have to do. So, lawyers perpetuate the case law, which was created essentially, and, and the destruction of the Constitution was sowed in the, in, in, uh, in the Marshall Court, which, of course, produced much of the case law that people study. They go to law school, they study McCulloch v. Maryland, they study Marbury v. Madison, and on down the line, Gibbons v. Ogden, Barron v. Baltimore. Now, of course, Barron v. Baltimore is not important anymore. That's, that's the one case that Marshall was actually correct, and Gibbons v. Ogden was also interesting because he didn't believe the Commerce Clause should be uh, applied to the to the states for intrastate commerce. 
So Marshall was not always incorrect, entirely incorrect, but of course this produces the, the common law system of the United States and the case law that uh, legal scholars, lawyers, judges then, lawyers become judges, this is what they keep enforcing. And so that is the problem, and the progressives in the 20th century have done much to undermine the original Constitution because of case law. It wasn't the war. I mean, look, the war did uh, say, through violence, that um, you can't secede. That didn't settle the legal question. What settled the legal question is all the case law that's produced. Uh, Supposedly, what settled the legal section is Texas v. White of 1869. I don't think it did. But if you go back and you say, all right, we're going we're to follow the, the courts. Well, S- Chase, Chief Justice Chase, ruled in Texas v. White that sus- unilateral secession is unconstitutional. Now, you can secede if the other states say you can do it, but unilateral secession is unconstitutional. Now, he was doing this because, because of course, the court wouldn't say, well, you know what, all those southern states were in the right legally. We fought a war. It was an illegal war now. So, but this is the point. Lawyers go and they learn. It's not that I mean, lawyers learn what they're taught. And, and as Sherman points out in the piece, well, you're, you have to answer when you take the bar exam, the 14th Amendment, for example, which is the incorrect interpretation of the 14th Amendment if you think it incorporates everything in the Bill of Rights. It's, it's not, it doesn't. Raoul Berger, I think, convincingly, wrote an entire book on this subject and convincingly tore that that argument apart. But, um, and he was, a, of course, a legal scholar, not, uh, not a Southerner. Uh, but I think that um, this is the major problem. So lawyers are doing what they're told to do through law school. They're told to enforce the case law. They're told to go look at that, and they're tied to it. They're told to uphold it. Um, and... That is the problem with John Marshall and, of course, how lawyers and judges, judges are lawyers, judge, lawyers become judges, what judges have done. Now, the, the plea in that is that don't do this. Learn the real history of the Constitution. And then when you become a judge, start working against this case law. You can make decisions which work against this. You can create new case law. But if you don't know it, if you're not taught it, you're not going to do it, you see. That's the curriculum. We're not taught Tucker or Upshur in law school. You're taught Story and Marshall. Well, that's problematic. You're not taught John Taylor of Caroline. You're taught Joseph Story. And Joseph Story is somehow seen as originalist. The guy was completely fabricating his interpretation of the Constitution. So um, I, I think that's... That's the important part of that piece. And then what else can, what, what can these, as the commenter on social media says, journalists, and then later it was politicians who, who destroyed things because people voted for these people, and of course they destroy things. But a lot of these politicians are lawyers. And not just that. What can, what can the political, what can people in office do to try to arrest us? So we ran a piece on Andrew Johnson, which, again, a lot of people on social media didn't like because Andrew Johnson, of course, sided with the Union during the war. And understandable. They say, how can you say that this guy tried to uphold the Constitution when he's supporting an unconstitutional war? Well, that's a valid criticism. But once Johnson became president and he saw what was going on with the Radical Republicans, his effort was to try to block their volumes of unconstitutional legislation. He was following Lincoln's plan of Reconstruction which I think had Lincoln lived, Lincoln would have also been vetoing a lot of this radical Republican legislation. Lincoln was trying to form his own party. And, of course, I've done a a podcast episode in my own podcast, The Brian McClanahan Show, on Andrew Johnson. Um, But, and that's uh, Michael Martin who wrote this piece, said he wrote it because of, of that particular podcast, that episode. But Johnson's veto messages are beautiful when it comes to originalism. And he's saying, look, you can't do this. You can't do it. Now, people would say, well, that's all because of race. I don't think so. When you read the messages, it's not because of race. He points out the unconstitutional nature of these particular bills and that you can't do this. Uh, So his job as president was to veto unconstitutional legislation. And one of the reasons Andrew Johnson was impeached is because he had the nerve to veto unconstitutional legislation. We We should want the president to do this 
to veto unconstitutional legislation. That's his job. That's his oath of office. He's defending his oath. My entire book, Nine Presidents Who Screwed Up America, is based on that premise. The president takes an oath of office to defend and uphold the Constitution. And by vetoing unconstitutional legislation, he's doing just that. We should want that out of the president. We should want the president to ignore unconstitutional legislation. We should want that. No, what we want the president to do is have an active legislative agenda and to go out and legislate from the executive office, which is not what the founding generation wanted the president to do. So this particular piece on Johnson is interesting because I think Martin does a nice job bringing out, he quotes several of these veto messages, and it's, it's nice. It's a nice examination of the presidency. And so I think that uh, at least the job of the president to veto legislation, we can learn something from Andrew Johnson about that. Uh, yes, Johnson was incorrect and wrong on the Constitution during the war. But after the war, he was trying to be a good steward of that document. And uh, I think that's where uh, we should give Johnson some credit. And that said, the last piece of the week, written by the great Mel Bradford in 1990, but republished here, uh, is about Thomas Johnson of Maryland, one of these forgotten founding fathers. And the reason I bring this up is because we talked about John Marshall. We talked about how lawyers interpret the Constitution. Of course, Andrew Johnson trying to defend the Constitution. But Thomas Johnson of Maryland was one of these founders, one of these friends of the Constitution that Marshall essentially was ignoring in all of his many decisions, which ran over originalism. Thomas Johnson was a friend of the document. But as Mel Bradford points out in this particular piece, uh, he says during, uh, this is his quote, um, all, of this, all of which is somewhat misleading, since like Thomas Jefferson, many Maryland Federalists agreed with their anti-Federalist adversaries concerning the propriety of a Bill of Rights, the necessity of limiting the jurisdiction of the United States Supreme Court and the Congress to those powers expressly delegated, and other restrictions on the scope of the federal powers. This is true. That is the most important part to understand from the ratification process. The friends of the document understood the opponents of the document, and they assured them that, yeah, I know that you have these issues here with the Constitution. I know that you're afraid, but don't worry. We're not going to abuse power. The states will have all the power. We agree with you. Thomas Johnson was one of those people. And it's important to understand these friends of the document because that is real originalism. It's not the anti-federalists. I mean, people like to say, well, let's read the anti-federalists because uh, they were right. Well, they were right. They, they were uh, prophetic in understanding what the Constitution would do. But it was the friends of the document that got the thing ratified. And their promises are what have been ignored by people like Alexander Hamilton and John Marshall and and uh, Abraham Lincoln and Henry Clay and Daniel Webster, and then on down the line, the progressives. It's the promises that were made in 1788 that have been ignored. People like Thomas Johnson would have been good stewards of the general government. Of course, the thing about Johnson that's interesting, too, is this guy was an important man, not because he served in government, but because of who he was. Uh, nowadays, you're important because you serve in government. We just saw this with the mass uh, fawning over George H.W. Bush and all the people that are important, all the presidents sitting in the front row. Um, uh, at least uh, two of which would not have been important unless they served in government. Clinton and Obama. Wouldn't have been anything remarkable about either one of those individuals, except they served in government. Uh, Jimmy Carter was a farmer, first and foremost. Donald Trump was a businessman. So these two, Carter and Trump, would have been important regardless of whether they were in government or not. Um, and I've, of course, spoken highly of Carter's character on uh, this particular podcast. Uh, the Bushes, well, they uh, they were important because they were in government, the entire Bush family. So it's a... It's a it is a, an American dynasty, government dynasty. And, of course, the Clintons are trying to do the exact same thing, and so are the Obamas. Ultimately, I think you'll, you'll see that. Uh, maybe not Michelle Obama, but perhaps one of the daughters will run for office. I mean, you're going to see this, and I think that you know Chelsea Clinton is very involved in government and philanthropic activity, but 
Maybe one point she runs for office somewhere. Hillary Clinton is already trying it. So um, those people are important because they're in government. Thomas Johnson was important just because of who he was. And, of course, that Friends of the Document, that Friends of the Constitution, that's an important thing to understand. That is originalism. It's what John Marshall ignored. It's what Alexander Hamilton ignored. And it's what uh, has destroyed this this, uh, willful ignorance of originalism, has destroyed the Constitution. Until next time, good day. (laughs) 